Once a teacher asked his uh, pupils how many kinds of birds there are. And um, one pupil raised his hand and he said, two. The teacher said, two. Yes, dead birds and living birds. And just like this kid, I want to make a plea that there are only two kinds of sciences. Sciences dealing with living systems and sciences dealing with non-living systems. And I want to make two statements about Charles Darwin. First, that Darwin can teach us a lot more about cooperation than about competition. And second, that Darwin can provide us the intellectual framework for the group of sciences dealing with living systems. We'll start with cooperation. And we'll go back to the time the plague entered Europe. A disease highly skilled in killing people and highly skilled in multiplying. So one might think it is a Darwinian champion, but it wasn't. It flourished only for a very short period of time. After some 15 years or so, it died out. It simply couldn't find any new human bodies to feast on. So we can conclude it was not very good in the art of cooperation. Some 50 years later, the syphilis virus was the new kid on the block, and it nearly made the same mistake. Infected people died in vast numbers in very short periods of time. If nothing has happened, the syphilis virus would have died out too. Luckily, that is from the perspective of the syphilis virus, a more friendly mutant popped up. One that didn't mutilate and kill its host, but only caused minor sores on the mouse and genitals. And because of this adaptation, the syphilis virus lives on to the present day. But we can go even one step further. In our guts, we have bacteria that um, have taken the friendly strategy to an even higher level. They descend from parasites, but now they are helping us by digesting our food, and doing so have become indispensable for us. And they are the real champions in cooperation. So the plague virus disappeared, the syphilis virus only leads a marginal life, only the former cooperative uh, parasite um, uh, flourishes and lives on in every one of us. During this process, something very important happened. As the former bacteria became an expert in digesting food, the human body tended to neglect these functions. And as a result, we became dependent on this bacteria. On the other hand, the bacteria became dependent on us because it, um, it wasn't challenged on roles like um, moving, finding food themselves, and dealing with uh, temperature and drought conditions. So, in the end, the two systems became dependent on one another. Eventually, they have grown into one system. And this appears to be a universal pattern in evolution. Evolution is as much about cooperation as it is about competition. Species do whatever it takes to survive. And cooperation is a key element in this. To understand what this means for us, we look at some of the historical mile, uh, milestones in the history of evolution. Life started with the ability of self-replication. Natural selection shapes organisms into the right structures. Cooperation between systems caused a huge leap in the size and complexity of living systems. Another major step in evolution is sexual reproduction. The early life forms adopted, adapted to a slow process of variation and selection of the best mutations. At one point in time, multicellular organisms started to exchange their elements, their DNA structures. And this leads to new, in some cases, more advanced and better adapted systems. After sexual reproduction, sexual selection came into existence. Think of a polar bear, which has to choose between two mating partners. A pure white one, and one with brown spots on his or her body. Which one to choose? Nature has a specific preference in this. Polar bears will always choose the white one, because by doing so, their offspring does have a much greater chance of survival. So preference for whiteness becomes a genetic determined force that enormously speeds up the adaptation process. We call this sexual selection. 
And now we have to ask ourselves a really important question. Does this way of operating limit itself to biological life forms alone? My answer is definitely no. I think we can strengthen our intellectual grip on this world when we acknowledge that all forms of life operate on the same simple set of Darwinian rules I just mentioned. And when I speak of life, I mean plants, animals, humans, but also ecological systems, economic constellations, companies, languages, political systems, ideologies and technology. All the phenomena we witness in the world of plants and animals, we also see in systems we usually consider man-made. Let's take a look at our world and see if we can find the methods of biological evolution in the world of cultural and technological evolution. First, replication. Think of the chain ladder. This is a bunch of information that feeds itself on simple human hopes and fears. Even intelligent people are deep inside afraid that the threats and promises in the chain letter might be real. However small the chance is, they really are. But because it takes so little effort to forward the email to 10 addresses, many people help spreading the information in the chain letter. And doing so, the chain letter has successfully reproduced itself. Natural selection. Think of information, tools and cultural habits that died out while others managed to survive. For example, the skills to catch mammoths died out when these big animals died out. It was no longer useful. Other clusters of information have adapted and doing so managed to survive. Think of the recipe to bake pancakes. 500 years ago, people baked pancakes, but because of changes in the availability of ingredients, changes in kitchen utilities, and changes in the taste of modern man, the way we bake pancakes changed too. We call this cultural adaptation. Third, cooperation between systems and sexual reproduction. Matt Ridley talks about ideas having sex. Just like in biology, mixing of teams leads to new innovations. When the wine press meets um, metal stamps, book printing emerged. It was Johann Gutenberg who connected these already available strings of information. When the idea of domesticating animals, which is also technology because natural things are shaped to man's desire, met the idea of a wheel, the horse carriage was born. This may seem obvious, but Mexican Indians invented the wheel, but never found a commercial technological application for it. Only the fact that it was used in children's toys prevented it from extinction. The ancient Greeks had discovered printing stamps, as was proven by the Festo disc. And they had excellent wine and olive presses. But they never brought the two together into a means of mass-producing books and texts. Finally, sexual selection. Natural selection favors white polar bears. Evolution is speeded up when polar bears develop a genetic preference for white mating partners. The history of the peacock shows that um, sexual selection can also lead to extravagancies and features being over-accentuated. For the early ancestors of the peacock, selecting mates on the basis of big feathers helped to speed up the adaptation process. But when the optimum was reached, this tendency should stop. But it didn't. So sexual selection leads to quicker ways to success or to quicker ways to failure. The same processes we see in organizational cultures. Entrepreneurs, like Henry Ford, for example, had a strong vision on the market and how their companies should be organized. Ford, for example, stressed efficiency, cost cutting, and uniformity. This was his vision to reach success, and in the beginning, it worked. Then sexual selection turned up. In this case, Ford promoted employees to management positions who had the very same ideas as he had. These managers behaved this way not because they had first-hand experience with the market themselves, but because it was rewarded by their CEO. They, on their turn, judged their employees on the same set of standards. This way, Ford created a very efficient, mass-producing monoculture. And this was highly successful until the market changed and price became second important to quality, luxury 
and diversity. What I want to show you is that biological evolution and cultural techno technological evolution are based on the very same principles. They are true twin brothers. Why is this important? We live in one world. We've only got this big blue globe to secure our future. Its processes and problems are vastly interconnected. Ecology influences economy and vice versa. Our, polit our politics are directed by our cultures. Our languages shape the way we look about and see the world, our physical and social environment. Technology has impact on psychology. Internet makes the way my father and grandfather feel, think and act completely different from the psychological functioning of my children. The only way to grasp the global challenges we are faced with is to see the world as one big interconnected super system. This means we must get rid of the artificial boundaries between the sciences. Too often they don't understand each other, neglect each other's finding, or are unable to see that they are working on the very same issues and problems without knowing. We are in urgent need for a unifying language for the sciences dealing with living systems. I think Darwin can provide us this unifying theory. We owe so much more to Darwin than just a way of looking at the natural world. His evolution theory provides us with a concept to grasp the essence of every living system, from ape to app, from insect to internet, and from spear to space shuttle. I hope by embracing this view, ideas will more easily flow from one science to another, and that disciplines may fertilize each other. I hope that this may lead to great new ideas, ideas we so desperately are in need of. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>